Uh -huh. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to our annual meeting this year. We have a really fabulous keynote speaker who's going to share some wonderful information with us. First, I do want to mention a few things to you. So let's just go to the second slide. All right. Well, nothing seems more appropriate than to start off by thanking people that have been involved in making this event happen and keeping our organization up and running. I want to start by thanking today's Zoom host, Rob Fobion. And this seems a perfect opportunity for Rob just to give us some guidelines to make sure the uh, meeting runs as smoothly as possible. Hi, everybody. So glad to be with you today. Yes, I'm Rob and very happy to be your Zoom host. Two quick things that we want to touch on. Uh, one, if you have not already, please mute your microphone. The microphone button should be down at the bottom on the left on your screen and just click it so that it shows it has a red stripe through it that shows that you're muted. It will help us if everybody is muted other than the person who's presenting because that way we don't use up as much bandwidth and it's easier for people to be able to get the signal and be able to join us today. The second is that while Angela is presenting, we want you to ask your questions. And we want you to do that by using the chat feature. Uh, instead of raising your hand, use the chat feature. If you're new to Zoom, down at the bottom of your window, there's an icon that looks like like a little thought bubble. You click on that and it opens up the chat box and then you can type your questions into the chat box. And at the end of Angela's presentation, we're going to answer all of your questions. So if you haven't already, go ahead and mute. And then while we're presenting, then you can ask your questions in the chat box. Thanks guys. Okay. Yes. And after the meeting is over, I'm going to ask Rob to save the chat. So if for any reason we don't get to all the questions, uh, we will follow up afterwards. And also, if you just sort of have some general FCA questions that don't have to uh, particularly do with legacy projects, go ahead and put them in anyway, and I will get back to you and make sure you have answers. So besides thanking Rob, I want to thank our keynote speaker, Angela Bocum. Give us a wave, Angela. There she is. Oh, I can't wait for you to see her beautiful presentation. I would also like to thank our members who have supported us in numerous ways, not just financially. Without your support, we just wouldn't be here. And of course, I want to thank our volunteers. As you all know, everyone that's involved with FCA is a volunteer, including me, the executive director, the board, people that work in the office, teach the classes, do the website, everybody. That's it. Okay, let's move on. Whoops. Uh, I do want you to know that we have annual reports for uh, fiscal year 2021. We have the meeting minutes and we have the treasurer's report for 2021. All you need to do is send us an email or call our office number and I will make sure that you have those documents. And I just want to remind you and thank you as well for ways that you can support us. This is a real important one. Our members um, often belong to groups and so forth where they can get that door opened for us. They can go and talk to the social activities coordinator in a residential community or someone that uh, heads up a group at their house of worship and so forth. There's all these possibilities. And we really don't. You being where you are is. Yeah. And, um, I don't know what's right for you. No, of course not. No, I don't know what's right for me. <laughs> you should do, you should do things that, um, Can we figure someone out needs who's to talking? mute themselves. And that are flexible for you. And sure. You know, if they end up being. So, just a reminder if you have not already, please mute your microphone. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, again, uh, if you can back up just to uh, one more slide, uh, Rob. Um, again, you can help us open the doors because we don't have enough volunteers that we can start making cold calls. 
<laughs> to see if anyone's interested. So we appreciate your help in that way. Okay, next. Okay, we have a wonderful website and we would love for people to visit it. Everything on our website is available to the entire community free of charge, including the Texas Advanced Directives and the Funeral Home Price Survey, which is being uploaded as we speak and a whole bunch of other information. They can just go out and we're gonna have a, a hot link right on the home page. You just click the little blue oval and boom, the 2022 funeral home price survey will open up and everybody is free to print it and distribute it wi widely. All right. And then of course, we're always um, looking for more volunteers. We have specific tasks that people can help us with. These are just a few examples. And then we do have periodic and ongoing tasks. Uh, a few of them do require some knowledge of Excel, but most of them don't. So if you just feel drawn to helping us out in that way, we would love for you to hear from us. We would love to hear from you because you're already hearing from us. <laughs> and then of course, another way to support us is to encourage people to join or to donate either when we do our sun summer fundraising or at any time that you like. And there's a link for that on our website. Okay, here we go, our flagship publication. Next slide. Okay, is, is there a way you can move that slide up at all or make it a little smaller so they can see that bottom line? I can't see it on my screen. Maybe everyone else can, I don't know. But anyway, here's some highlights. This is juicy stuff. This is why people need to uh, inform themselves ahead of time because almost everyone I've ever spoken with said they'd rather leave more money above ground, so to speak, than in the ground. So look at the range this year on direct cremation that uh, someone can pay $595 to get that done, or we have another provider in the survey that charges $4,210 to do exactly the same thing. Think about the price difference. I mean, it, that's a jaw dropper, don't you think? And then immediate burial, that's where you don't have a visitation and a funeral service ahead of time, but you can certainly have a memorial service afterwards and you don't even have to involve the funeral home. So we have a column for that in the survey. And again, look at the price variance. I'm not going to tell you which funeral homes they are because I want you to download the funeral home price survey and find them for yourself. And then the full funeral service by that time it gets so expensive uh, and people that can afford that kind of thing, we have really no clue as to how much they are willing to pay for a casket. It could just be anything. So um, that's why we do not put the casket price in this. So these prices, these last two prices that you see here don't yet include the casket. And they certainly don't include the cemetery plot, the grave liner for the cemetery plot, if the cemetery requires that, which most of them do, and also the opening and closing costs. So this typically is why direct cremation is typically far more affordable. Okay, so those are some of the highlights. Now I want to turn things over to Angela, who has organized and facilitates and hosts Austin Death Doula Meetup. That's how I first met her because um, the concept of being a death doula really appeals to me. It's a very heart-centered calling. And so I go to the monthly meetups and um, learn things and uh, once in a while have an opportunity to maybe share some end of life kind of information that FCA folks know about. But that's how I first met Angela. And uh, gee, it's been quite a while now, almost a year. And so with great enthusiasm, I'm going to turn the program over to her. And then she can tell you uh, more about herself if she feels drawn to do so. Take it away, Angela. Thank you so much, Nancy. 
Um, first off, I just want to thank you all for allowing me to be here with you today. Um, this is truly an honor for me. I have been an admirer of the Funeral Consumers Alliance for some time now, um, and it truly is wonderful what the uh, what the group does. So I'm I'm an admirer of Nancy's as well, <laughs> as you, those of you who are familiar with her will understand. Um, so it was just such a such a gift to be offered this opportunity to speak to you all today. And so um, I'm going to share my presentation with you all. So I'll make sure that you can see all of that. Um, so first off, myself, I am a trained end-of-life doula in addition to being a master of social work. I am trained by the International, uh, sorry, <laughs> International End-of-Life uh, Doula Association. So um, Anelda is what we're called. I was trained at the end of 2019. Since that time, I have been an, uh, a very enthusiastic hospice volunteer, and I work primarily doing grief and bereavement counseling uh, with that group. So that is my primary area of focus, but this work is truly something that I'm very passionate about. And I am very pleased to be able to share one of my favorite parts of this work with you all today, because it's something that is not so specific to end of life. So during the time I have to speak with you today, we're gonna run through just what it is an end of life or death doula is. Uh, if you have not heard of us before, uh, it can be kind of a new idea. And those of you who have heard of us before, I'll just go into a little bit more of the specifics of what kinds of things we do. I'm gonna jump into what legacy work is because legacy work is that beautiful thing that I was brought here to speak to you all in depth about that you can really do in any time of your life. We're going to talk about how you turn legacy work into a legacy project, something that is tangible that you can do, how to get started, and then I'm going to share with you some online resources. Um, and throughout, you may, of course, ask questions in the chat box, uh, but I will also make sure that we have time at the end for as much Q&A as we need. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about what it is a death doula or end of life doula is. You may have also heard the phrase death coach, um, because basically what a doula does is someone, it, it means someone who helps. Um, traditionally, it meant um, a person who helped another person through a transition. It's an ancient Greek word, so it's something that's been around a long time, but where most people come across it now is in the birthing world. So a lot of people have heard of a birth doula who helps a family through the transition from pregnancy to the birth of a child. A death doula is the same thing for the other end of the life cycle. So we help people through their transition from life into the thing that is next for them. So through the death and dying process, and we help families through the bereavement process as well. I think it's important to highlight that we are a non-medical support. Um, we are in the title death doula, not designated as being a nurse or someone who provides medication. Um, we are instead someone who provides more holistic care for the whole person at end of life, as well as their family. So those who are versed in hospice and palliative care, this may sound a lot like some of the support professionals who are present in that process, especially the social workers or uh, perhaps the chaplains, but the doula is able to be more flexible with serving the needs of an individual and their family. So hospice volunteers may come in for kind of a limited time. They're usually present for you know, an hour or two a week uh, with a family member to provide respite. Their responsibilities can also be restricted by the hospice that they're volunteering through. With a doula who's brought in either hired or volunteers with a family or an individual who is at the end of their life, they can come in whatever time is discussed and, and arranged between 
the, the client or the person who has hired them and the doula. It can be a lot of intensive time uh, or it can be kind of a lot of short spurts. It can also be a short-term kind of relationship. So near the very end of someone's life, a doula might come in to help very intensively in the last days or weeks. A doula can also come in years in advance and help with a lot of tasks over that time span. So in the end, doulas are really kind of diverse helping professionals. So doula services can include a number of different stages and things. Uh, it starts with planning and preparation. So that is kind of planning for long-term end of life tasks or talking through things that someone wants to work out in kind of preparing for that stage of life. And also preparations like funeral planning, if that is something that someone wants to discuss. Um, the doula provides support in the dying process. So that can be right at the moment in the days or hours leading up to and immediately following a death. And then longer term support following the death. This can be anything from assisting with funeral proceedings to assisting the family in bereavement after a loss. These are some kind of broken down typical doula tasks, but I wanna emphasize that typical is a very important word here. Every doula comes in with a different set of skills. So I said before that doula designates someone as kind of a non-medical professional, but that's not to say that there aren't doulas who are nurses or who are medical professionals. So each doula basically has a menu of things that they might present. They might come to, um, they might come to bring to a family or an individual. And that's just based on their strengths, their experiences, and their interests. So some of the most common are assessing needs and desires, talking to someone about what they want and helping them to protect that, being the advocate for someone in their final days and hours. There's also quality of life management. If perhaps a family or an individual does not have the knowledge or words for pursuing comfort in their treatment or after treatment, um, or kind of as they're, they're getting close to their final days, then the doula can help them to talk through what is it that you want and how can we advocate for that to medical professionals, to family members, whatever that person's circumstances might include. It also includes spiritual and emotional needs, which is a big, broad category. And again, very much is different from doula to doula. A lot of doulas bring in their personal uh, beliefs in, into their practice. That's not to say that they impose their beliefs on a person, but there are doulas who specialize in certain belief systems or spiritualities, religions, and they can be an expert or a helper in that if it is desired. They can also just talk and listen in a way that can be really helpful um, talk about meaning making in the last days, talk about worries about where things are going, unfinished business, people that a person maybe wants to reach out to but doesn't know how to, and um, life review, which means talking through where did this life begin? What are the stories there? And very importantly, especially today, is legacy work which includes a little bit of that investigation into what someone is working to create uh, before their final days. They can also provide basic family respite and support. So some of those things that may be similar to other services. They can provide document assistance, including help with advanced care and medical directives. Uh, they can uh, help with vigil planning so that's helping people plan what their last moments might look like. They can help create plans for disposition and funerals, and they can also assist with bereavement support and so many more things. So once again, it just depends on the doula as to what they provide and 
what they can assist people through. So I wanna get an idea of what you all think about this word legacy. So we're here today to talk about legacy projects or legacy work. That can seem like a really big word. So what do you think when you hear the word legacy? And I would love to hear some of your thoughts in the chat. I know that when I hear it, I have a number of big thoughts rolling around in my head about, oh gosh, okay, that sounds intimidating. It sounds important. But what do you think? One of our folks today says, legacy is something I'm leaving for my family. Another says, what is different because I lived my life? Another of our folks today says, information about my parents and my grandparents. Hmm. And another participant says, I think of a videotaped genealogical interview for future generations. Ooh. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. yeah, these are wonderful answers. Another of our participants says, leaving something behind that was important to you and you want to share that with your family and your community. And another participant says that legacy is, what do I stand for? What mattered most to me? Oh, I love that one. These are some fabulous answers. Um, and I, I love that it's not just encompassing us. You know, it's, it's not the person who's saying it. There's so much of it that's involved with other people, whether it be ancestors or you know, relatives who came before, people who come after, the whole community. This is really fabulous. So I think these are some great definitions. Um, one of the, the most concise written definitions that I could find was just a thing handed down by a predecessor. And that is so broad that I think it's hard for us to pin down very specific things. Um, but it does help us get a sense of, okay, this is something that has a longer existence than just us, right? Um, so again, this can sound so big and intimidating. It sounds like it has to be the perfect thing. It has to be extremely meaningful. It has to be poetic. You know, it has to be a monument, you know, a statue of our likeness in the middle of a park where everyone can see. And the bottom line is it does not have to be a monument or a building with our name on it. It doesn't have to be something big and showy and expensive, right? When I think of legacy, I try to think about something I call daily legacy. Daily legacy is me living by my values in a way that leaves a different kind of footprint. It might be the kind of footprint that washes away in minutes or hours or days, but I believed in that footprint when I made it and it was uniquely mine. And thinking about daily legacy, I think brings me back to that statement about, about really holding true to something you, you believe in, you know? And I, I really like that that comes up. So when we think about legacy work, how we work on what we leave behind, um, I think it's important to kind of designate what is legacy work and what is not legacy work. So it's that footprint, that mark on the world in some way, shape or form. It doesn't have to be a physical mark, right? It can be a smile to a cashier who's having a rough day. Uh, it can be, uh, a, you know, a wave at someone and, a, and just, you know, connecting with another person. It can be a way to share your story and wisdom. Anything from giving a little piece of advice to a friend to, 
telling someone a really important part of your life. It can be just an inward focus on your life and who you are. So legacy work starts with looking inward and saying, okay, what is it that is meaningful to me? And how does that impact what I feel is my place in the world? It can be a way to connect with loved ones. It can be something that is really just meaningful to you. This doesn't have to be for anybody else. It really can be just for you. It is absolutely not required, like I said, to be big and showy or extraordinary. It is not required to last forever. It's not always public. It's not always something that can be finished or gets finished. And it's absolutely 100% not the same for everybody. So everyone is able to figure out what would be most meaningful for them or the people that they do wanna include in their project if that's something that you want to do. But I think it's always helpful to think about how this work is a, re a reflection of you. So who does legacy work and when do you do it? So I know I've talked a lot about end of life doula work, um, but that's just to tell you a little bit about where I come from in initially learning about this work and where it kind of most commonly comes into play. Cause I don't think people think about it, uh, you know, midlife as often as maybe they, they could. Um, so it's often an adult or someone at end of life, uh, but really it's something that anyone can do at any time. It's also something that can be done individually or it can be done with loved ones or friends. Um, I often think of groups that get together to do some sort of activity um, like quilting groups or, or book clubs and you know, um, families who come together for big meals. And those times of gathering, I think we see what's really important to us and it can be a great time or a great place or those can be great people to get involved in the things that are important to you. So you don't have to be looking down the barrel of the last few days in order to do a legacy project. In fact, it's something that really, when it started earlier, can be enormously impactful. Because if you don't start it until you really feel a kind of a, a, a more desperation, because you're, you're suddenly thinking, oh no, I only have so much time to leave something behind, then the chances of it being something that is holistically helpful to you, that is fulfilling to you, and the chance of you being able to reach a point of completion with it where you feel like you can let it go, that is, that is a real thing, that is a real feeling. So, I think it's something that often gets left in the I wish pile or the when I retire pile or the when I'm done with that responsibility, when I'm done with that uh, particular busy thing in my life, then I'll get around to this. And I think that that can often be a mistake. So starting it whenever you feel like you know what you want it to be is the right time. So sometimes I do wanna point out that this is something that is not done by the person that it is focused on. And it's something that can be done after a loss has already been experienced. The loved one or loved ones of someone who has passed are always able to create a legacy project on behalf of the person that they've lost. So there's no wrong time. There's no wrong person, there's no wrong way. This is something that happens when it needs to and when it can. So a legacy project, which I've already, which I've already mentioned a, a number of times, is any creative process that turns your legacy, wisdom, life lessons, or story 
into a thing. And a thing is an intentionally broad term. I know it sounds strange, but what I mean by a thing is a physical object, a video or audio recording. It can also be something somewhat intangible. Uh, it can be a tradition that you help start or that you inspire in others. It can be a game, a performance. It can be a box of special things, a piece of art or music, or even a story that is told over and over again. Because I know a lot of our families and friends are probably very fond of this one funny story about that time we did that silly thing. And it can be part of our legacy. The things that people remember are the places where our legacy lives. So think of a legacy project as a vessel for that memory. So there are no rules about what this thing can or cannot be. And that really can make it seem intimidating sometimes. Um, so we're gonna break it down a bit more um, and see if we can make it a little bit more of a friendly process so you don't feel like you just have to capture your entire life in a bottle. So to get started with a project, again, you can do it alone or with one or more loved ones. Um, this, you kind of want to decide, um, and it's not a clear line about which you have to do first, but you want to decide early on who might be able to help you, or is this something you really want to do by yourself? And if you do want to do it by yourself, is there help you need for certain parts of it? The people who are involved can be really crucial to not only how you go about doing a project, but deciding what your project can be, because a team can sometimes accomplish a lot different things than an individual on their own. You can always start a project with whatever time is available. If you have really, really busy weekdays, or really, really busy weekends, but you wanna start a project, Figure out where you have an hour a week and make that hour a week your time. Or put your project ideas or materials in a place where you're going to see them regularly and you can spontaneously sit down and work on it anytime you want. Some projects require more planning than others and more coordination. So just be mindful of what kind of project is not only going to be uh, appropriate for you, but what's gonna be practical for you? What time do you have to devote to it? You can work with whatever resources you have available to you. Um, yeah, there's probably someone whose legacy is captured in a major motion picture. Great for them, not my thing. I never want to have that done. So if I have something that's captured on a cell phone camera, I'm gonna be very happy with that because that's something that is more meaningful to me because it, it can be held by people that I care about. It's something that I can control and I can send. And it's nice to just have that, that connection. So it doesn't have to be big and fancy, um, doesn't have to cost a bundle. And like I said, if it's just a tradition or a story told from person to person, it doesn't cost a penny, but it can be really deeply meaningful and can keep people connected over time. And as always, it can be done before or after a loss. It can be done decades before, it can be done decades after, it does not matter. So this slide has a list of examples. I'm gonna let you have um, this slide to, to look over later. So you can look at this list in detail for reference. But for now, I'm going to take you through some slides with some examples of each of these on them so that we can go into them in a little bit more concrete way. So I want to start with photos because I think they're one of the most common, popular, and accessible ways of recording a legacy. So starting with just a very simple solution, a memory box. A memory box can contain a lot of photos. They don't have to be mounted or pretty. Um, they can just be in a shoebox on a shelf 
or they can be in a really nice box that you've decorated and organized depends what kind of person you are but it's just a place where you can keep them and you can get them out and you can just flip through them one recommendation i do have for something like a memory box is making sure that printed photos do have uh, notes written on the back um, if you don't want to write directly on the photo, get a sticky note or something um, to put on there, because when those are reflected on later, it can be really hard to keep all of the ideas straight. I have a family member with dementia, and I know that having those names and those dates on it is really helpful to me to be able to reflect and participate with them, even if I was not a part of the time when the photo was taken. So. A memory box is a great thing. Just make sure you make it something that's organized enough that you can go through it uh, with people who might be important, or you can go through it yourself in a way that uh, helps you remember and reflect on where you've been. It can also contain other objects. It doesn't just have to be photos. So you can put important mementos in there, um, little objects that are meaningful, ticket stubs, anything that you want to include can be in that memory box. Scrapbooks, of course, are a great organized way to keep everything. Um, they do require a little bit more time and materials, but again, they don't have to be super fancy. Um, they are a great place to put little notes, little flat mementos, um, envelopes or stamps or, or you know, little, little more flat objects. Um, but they're also just a really great place to kind of organize things chronologically. Um, they do, like I said, take time, and um, but I will say that if you don't want to do it by hand, there are online resources um, that will collect your photos for you. You kind of, you know, upload them, put them in, and then they'll print a book for you. So there are lots of ways to do scrapbooks if you don't feel like cutting and gluing or, or writing in that book yourself, um, although that can be a really fun and engaging activity. So with the time you have, with the resources you have, organize it how it may, makes sense to you. You can also use photos for more creative uh, displays. So there are lots of companies now that will print photos on different objects for you. They will print them on fabric. They will print them on jewelry. Um, they will put them on all sorts of objects, mugs and t-shirts and whatever you feel like. So you can incorporate photos into those things as well. You can put photos into three-dimensional displays. Um, one of my favorite ways is to have a kind of shrine or altar in uh, the house. And that's just a place to collect a few photos of a loved one, um, a few memories, maybe things that remind me of them. And then I can have that space. And again, this doesn't have to be for someone who has passed. I know that, that this looks like something that has to be done in retrospect, but it can be very helpful for someone uh, to see their own life on display, or it can be very comforting to see important benchmarks from your life set up in a place where you can look at them and reflect on them all together. So um, this is something that I think is a wonderful thing to have at any stage. Um, and you can make it as bright or colorful and creative as you want. You just need a space for it. So one of the most common ways that people think about recording a legacy is in writing. And I wanna emphasize that writing is fabulous. It uh, is great to put a story down on paper, but it is absolutely not the only way to record your story. That being said, letters, poems, stories, notes of any kind can be written for loved ones, can be written as a, a memoir, um, uh, but it can be something that is has a specific purpose, um, and those can be especially meaningful. So one of my favorite forms of a legacy project is for someone to write letters or cards for special days to be sent now or later. So um, if you want to write your future grandchildren and great grandchildren letters for when they turn 18, or you know, there are, there are times when 
you want to record something for a very special day that might be coming up in a few years, but hasn't happened yet, you can go ahead and write that letter. Go ahead and have those things ready to go. Um, it is never too early to share some thoughts with someone that you care about. And it's never too late. If you do have things that you want to be sent down the road, uh, I find it very helpful to have kind of a partner in crime on that and to uh, help have them help you remember that you wanted to do that, have them, you know, clued into your calendar, or whatever way you keep track of those important days. And if there comes a time where you aren't able to be the one that sends them, they still get where they need to go. Journals and memoirs are also wonderful. So many people just really appreciate having a journal or memoir of someone uh, that, that they loved. Um, so it's not only a thing you can share now to tell people about the life you lived, maybe before you knew them, or um, kind of a way to show them how you came to be where you are. Um, it can be something that gets to stay on and be shared and passed from person to person in a really beautiful way, even people that maybe you don't know. Stories or poems that teach important ideas can also be a great resource, especially when you have uh, children or grandchildren or great grandchildren that you want to send something on into the future. Um, so you might have a story that you tell that is told to the next generation that is told to the next generation. Um, or a poem that you write that is kind of reflects on that big meaning that you feel. Um, and that can be a really wonderful way to, to keep that idea or that value alive. And one of my uh, other favorites is an advice jar. Um, if you have been through a life, then you've got lessons to share with people who are following in your coattails, right? So you can collect a jar of things that are important that your loved ones can draw from when they need to hear what you have to say. They want to be able to draw on your wisdom. So you just take little pieces of paper, um, you can type them up, you can write them by hand, whatever you want, and you can put them in a jar and just put on a label, you know, advice from me, and they'll have that as long as they need it. Audio and video recordings are a, another way that you can do similar things to what writing can do, but sometimes this is not only a great way to record it without having to sit down and type or write for long stretches of time, uh, but it can also be something you can do with someone because you want someone there maybe to do the recording or to ask you questions. So you can pre-record messages for special days, just like you would uh, pre-write cards for those special days. You can tell your story. You can uh, do interviews with family and friends. So it, it just sit down with someone you care about and say, what questions do you have about my life? Or you can say, I just, I wanna talk to you about my life and see what comes up. You can read favorite stories or poems aloud. Uh, I watched a wonderful video this week of a grandmother reading a, a book to her granddaughter and her granddaughter was looking at the camera screen or the, the uh, laptop screen with the most adoring, completely attentive look on her face. And that's something that she gets to have forever. It can be a recording, a playlist, a collection or a mixtape of your favorite music. If you make music, you can record yourself, but if you just have a collection of really great music that you wanna make sure other people get to share, you can absolutely share that collection. These things are also great because they can be kept online. Someone can keep them on their phone, on um, their computer, wherever it's easiest for them to access. So, there are a couple of links down at the bottom of this slide to StoryCorps and the Conversation Project, which are just a couple of resources to get you started if this sounds like something you're interested in. There's also a whole world of keepsakes and crafts. Um, these are just a tiny few. I think the only thing you have to think about when making a craft is, does it connect with who you are? 
is it something that when someone looks at it, they're going to say, oh yeah, that's, that's them. That's some, that's some part of them that's important. Because if you hate gardening and you tell your loved ones, I want a memory garden, they're probably going to think, I, I mean, okay, we'll put your name on it. But when you go walk around that garden, it's not going to connect with you the same way. But if you love to cook, Write down some of your favorite recipes and pass those along to people you care about. Recipe collections or a family cookbook are another thing that you can either write by hand or you can share online, or there are some wonderful um, resources online to put your recipes into a, um, a template and then a company will actually print a cookbook for you. Another fun one is a quilt made of clothing. Um, or important fabrics. If someone is a quilter, um, this is a great way to feel close to someone when they had very particular tastes or interests. So favorite sports teams, if they were a big fan of funny sayings on t-shirts, you can always have things that make you feel close to them, that make you remember them. And memory pillows, also a very good one. Um, memory pillows, there's lots of tutorials online, so I linked to one of them, but oftentimes they're just a pillow made out of the shirt of a loved one that you can hug when you're missing that person. So traditions and rituals and plans, these are highly specific to families um, and to loved ones, groups of, of people who care about one another. Just to make sure that it is your legacy that is being marked, communicate the time or thing that is important to you. Or talk to people and say, what, what do you think is the holiday where I really play a big role? Or, you know, when you think of, of family holidays or our friend get-togethers, what, what part do I play? What's the thing that, that I take responsibility for? And that might highlight what sort of tradition is appropriate for your legacy. It can be a game, a celebration, a time for contemplation, a gathering, a meal. A ritual doesn't have to be a big holiday ordeal. It could be Sunday coffee with the same group of folks. My grandparents went to uh, Bojangles, for anyone from the Southeast, went to Bojangles every Sunday and they would reflect on the people who were there and the people who weren't, but they kept that going and it was just their ritual and it was a way to keep connected. A family, or tr family tree or genealogy can also be done online or on paper. Um, the picture you see here is actually my family genealogy that was done by my grandfather prior to his passing. He spent years on it. He updated it every single year for us. We'd go to visit at Christmas and he would hand us the new pages that, and he would write down which number of pages we had to update. Very, very much his project, but everyone in my family has one of these and it's hugely meaningful. Goes back to the 1700s and I would never have known any of this had he not spent years doing research and bringing this all together. You can also undertake an ethical will. So an ethical will is not a legal binding document. Um, and a lot of you in this group are probably familiar with it, but it's instead something that communicates to your loved ones, just more um, informally, what those wishes and desires are. And you can also come up with a bucket list or action plan just for you or for your loved ones. So say you love to travel, Make that bucket list of what you want to do and when you want to do it and how, or tell your loved ones, okay, I went to these places when I was younger and I really want you to go there someday. Tell them what was special about it, help them create their action plan or create your action plan. All right, so in your email invitations to today's event, you were provided with a worksheet. Um, and that worksheet is to help you in your brainstorming and planning process if this sounds like something you're ready to get started on. So you can use that to uh, think or write 
type, draw, whatever makes sense to you. And there's a couple different pages on that worksheet to help you make this a little bit more easy uh, process to, to digest. So the worksheet has a few different pages. The first sheet, front and back, is a brainstorming sheet. So it has some questions to get you thinking about what your legacy is, who wants, to, who you want to be involved, and just really dig into what would be meaningful for me thinking about my own legacy. This is also something you can share with anyone who might be working with you, or you can get together a group of people and maybe you can all hold each other accountable for working your way through from time to time. Again, this isn't a step-by-step -step prescriptive process. You get to use whatever's useful to you. So there's no right or wrong way. Make it the way that it makes sense to you. If a question isn't quite a good fit, skip it and move on. The second part of the worksheet is a planning document. So it asks you questions about writing down the specifics. The what are you making? Who's gonna be involved? What materials do you have or need? And it walks you through that step of getting it started. So I hope that that is something of use to you. Um, my email is at the bottom of that worksheet as well. You can absolutely share it with family and friends, with people who are working with you. If you do wanna share it in a different environment, like a professional setting or in a larger group setting, shoot me a quick email and just let me know. I would love to know how it's being used and um, provide you know, the, the little thumbs up there. <laughs> So last few slides, there's some online resources. These are things that some of them are linked in other parts of the presentation, but these are just some ideas to get you started and some places that have nice long lists of how to go about this or um, some tips in planning. And then the last one is a video that is one of my favorite legacy projects where an artist in Seattle asked her friends and loved ones to perform a water ballet in the park in her honor and it was just very moving. So if you have seven minutes, that video is well worth a watch. And if you are interested in doula services, of course you can reach out to me and I have a, a small but mighty network of doulas in this area um, and even one in Canada. Um, and we are happy to point you in the direction of some different resources, but you can also just look for people who might meet your specific needs or desires in any one of the contact lists for these organizations. And that is where I will end. Um, but yeah, Nancy, I will hand it back to you or uh, see if we have any questions in the chat and you want to take a moment to, to talk those through. Um, I do want to assure you that those handouts that were sent to you as email attachments, that even the note taking pages uh, on the side where you see uh, screenshots, those are live links. So you can just open up the note taking pages and go to those, especially those last slides that Angela just showed you and just click on something you wanna know more about and you'll go right where uh, you'll get the information that you need. We do have a couple of uh, comments and questions. One of our participants, when you had asked what legacy means, says that leaving instructions as to who to leave what to, so there's less chance of fussing between the family and members and friends, which I think is a wonderful suggestion. It reminds me of what my mother has done. She has been the collector of all of the family objects for years. And so all the things that have been passed down through the generations she now has. And so she went around the house and put numbers on the bottoms of everything and then wrote in a notebook what each number is and the story that goes with it so that family members after she has passed will know, oh, this was great grandfather Alberg's whatever. And he had the first automobile dealership in Georgetown and the stories that went with it. So I thought that was a really lovely thing for her to do. One of the questions we have uh, from our participants is how many doulas like yourself are here in Texas? 
I could not even begin to answer that. Um, one of the most active advocates and teachers is actually right near nearby, uh, Deanna Cochran, who is linked in the presentation. She teaches doulas. And so she, she teaches um, internationally. So there are doulas, not only in Texas, who she has taught, but there are people all over. Um, I, I would say that there's probably more than you think. Um, and you can usually search those directories that I linked by location. So you should be able to search for Texas doulas and maybe even by zip code, uh, depending on which directory that you go to. And another person asked about how do you find a doula? And I think you answered that question to us to either those links that you shared or to email you directly. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yep. It just depends on what you're looking for um, because every doula is going to provide something unique. Terrific. Angela, can you back up to the slide uh, that shows where to find doulas? Yes. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah. So the directories that Angela was talking about are the first two bullets. Uh, those are organizations that doulas belong to and that do doula training. So as uh, Angela said, you can go to those first two um, websites, uh, NIDA and Anelda, and they have directories that, and you can uh, sort uh, the members by state. Mm -hmm. I and think then, Doula uh, Givers does as well. If, uh, oh, does it? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then there's Deanna Cochran. She's the fourth bullet, <laughs> quality of care. Mm -hmm. Nice job. We have oh. more questions? Those are the questions that we have. Lots of great thank yous to Angela from our participants on what a wonderful and meaningful presentation this was. Wonderful. So can we do my last two slides? We um, will. Rob? We'll get this wound up here. Okay, how about that? <laughs> so thank you. Yes, thank you for attending. And the next slide about staying in touch. That's how to get in touch with us. Again, if uh, you have any questions about um, uh, things that Angela talked about or just the kinds of things that FCA knows about, uh, stay in touch with us. And of course, if you have uh, a bit of time to volunteer, I bet we could find a nice little task match for you or just email us and say hi. Okay, anybody got some last minute comments? Why don't we get a wave out from our board members? We did have one last question. And I think Nancy, this would probably go to you. It says beyond cremation, now folks are talking about green burials. How do we find information about that? There's actually a website called the Green Burial Council that you can just Google that. It's probably Green Burial Council, either .org or .net. And they have a list of green burial cemeteries around the country. We have a green burial cemetery in our area out in Cedar Creek. It's called Eloise Woods, E-L-O-I-S-E-W-O-O-D-S.com. The, and it's like being buried in a forest, <laughs> but they know where all the bodies are, <laughs> as the expression goes, because they uh, do a GPS measurement on every time they do an interment, they have exactly the GPS coordinates for where that body is buried. And then uh, down in La Vernia, which is closer to San Antonio, there's Countryside Memorial, which is actually a hybrid cemetery. Uh, they have older um, uh, plots there that are traditional plots, but in more recent times in a separate section, everything is a green burial. Sonny Markham, who owns it, is a fantastic person. And uh, their, their website, I believe, is countrysidememorial.com. Nice and uh, straightforward. 
and they have a lovely Facebook page too, if for those of you that do Facebook. And then there's another one coming up that's kind of in the works between Bastrop and Smithville, but they don't have a website yet. Uh, I'm hoping that they will be um, up and running, so to speak, by the time we do our 2022 cemetery survey. We do that every other summer. So I'm hoping uh, we'll have that one on our survey as well for you. So green burial is wonderful. Everything that goes in the ground has to be biodegradable. So that means no concrete grave liners. And usually uh, the grave markers are very simple. Uh, Sunny is uh, Markham with Countryside Memorial is very artistic. And some families have asked her specifically to um, engrave a, a beautiful stone with the name of the decedent and um, even sometimes a little phrase as well as the dates of birth and death. And one of our participants also noted that there is a great documentary online called mm -hmm. A Will in the Woods and it's about green burials here in North America. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh yeah, one more thing I wanted to say about countryside. Um, it's like being buried in a meadow as opposed to uh, Eloise Woods out in Cedar Creek is more like being buried in a forest. So it just depends on what the natural terrain is, uh, what each uh, green burial cemetery is gonna look like. And a lot of them, including uh, the two I've been talking about, will actually, um, if the family wants to open and close the grave, they have the option to do that. So a lot of people that like home funerals, you know, home funerals are legal in Texas. You don't have to hire a funeral home at all, unless perhaps to help you get the death certificate. Um, but otherwise, uh, the families can do all the after death care themselves, transport the body and um, dig the um, burial plot open and then close it afterwards. Nancy, has this uh, session been recorded? Yes. Oh, good. Thanks. Yes, in a few days, uh, we will have the uh, URL to the recorded session on our website under the events tab. And a special, thank, a special thanks, Nancy, uh, to you for doing this and for Angela for the presentation. Thank Excellent. You, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Roger Erickson was my predecessor. Um, <laughs> as uh, the president of the board, and he certainly set a very high benchmark and was very inspiring. So thank you, Roger. You're welcome. Okay, we done? Okay, let's turn it off. <laughs> Everybody wave goodbye. <laughs>